the beginning of the 20th century, there began a revolution in philosophy that became what is now known as analytic philosophy. The English philosopher Bertrand Russell was at the forefront of this revolution. Russell claimed that knowledge is an overly vague term since it must include both human and animal knowledge and within human knowledge it must include both everyday and scientific knowledge. Russell's colleague G. E. Moore held a common sense view of knowledge. He believed that the being of a thing is independent from the knowledge we may have of it. Consciousness only reflects what is real. Cartesian skepticism about the external world simply isn't justified. So elemental proofs that were monumentally difficult for Descartes, proving that your hands exist, for example, were for more simplicity itself. So how do I prove that they're hands, according to Moore? This way. Here's one hand. Here's another. I just proved that there were two hands. What more do you want? Um, this is a view in philosophy called direct realism. Direct realism in this sense. Moore thinks that I can know things through perception without being able to prove them. In other words, I don't need an argument to know everything. It is a kind of foundationalism. Foundationalism that says, look, you want to know whether there are hands? How do you do that? You open your eyes and you look. You don't give an argument for the claim that there are hands. The Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein was an early pioneer in the rigorous analysis of language in philosophy. He attempted to move the concept of meaning from the fact or object represented by words to the use given to those words by a particular community. As language only acquires meaning when employed by people, any link between a given word and its object depends on the rules set by those who use that word. These rules define what Wittgenstein called language games. He believed that all of us who engage in the same language game employ here's a hand as a bedrock proposition, one which cannot, under ordinary circumstances, be doubted, because that is a fact about the language game itself. Wittgenstein and, and, and other philosophers who, whom he influenced um, felt that philosophical questions are a matter of language. And it's a matter of understanding our language better, or our language games, that philosophical puzzles arise because something has gone wrong in our, the language, or maybe because philosophers have started misusing our language. G. E. Moore's common sense epistemology was a form of foundationalism the proposition that beliefs are ultimately justified by irrefutable foundational beliefs. Coherentism rejects this view entirely. A belief, say coherentists, can be called knowledge when it fits together with the rest of your beliefs. They believe that justification is not a linear process, but rather a collection of criteria that come together to justify a system of beliefs. The American philosopher Willard Van Orman Quine described this as the web of belief, a kind of seamless whole that is never immune from revision. In 1969, Quine wrote an article entitled Epistemology Naturalized, in which he put forth a radical new vision of epistemology. How did it transpire that the senses were bombarded by light waves and the like, uh, and sound waves. And ultimately, they, uh, these same people who were bombarded by light and by sound issued forth in various sentences that formulated scientific theories. Or if we can talk about beliefs, that they came to believe certain scientific theories about the beginning of the cosmos, the universe, or about uh, what happened to the dinosaurs, and so on. How did that all happen? Well, that's a question for basically how the mind works, uh, how uh, 
do beliefs form and theories form? But that's a question for psychology. And uh, Quine said in a very radical way, uh, well, so epistemology should be part of psychology. The totality of our so-called knowledge or beliefs, from the most casual matters of geography and history to the profoundest laws of atomic physics or even pure mathematics and logic, is a man-made fabric which impinges upon experience only along the edges. Another major challenge to traditional notions of epistemology came in the form of a brief but penetrating article written by the American philosopher Edmund Gettier. Gettier assaulted the idea of justified belief with the following scenario. Suppose two people, Smith and Jones, went in for a job interview. They're sitting next to each other outside the boss's office. And as they're waiting, Smith watches as Jones counts the coins in her pocket. She has ten coins. Jones goes into the interview, and just then, the boss walks by and tells Smith that Jones is an old family friend, and there's no way she's not getting the job. Smith is disappointed, to be sure, and he mumbles disconsolately to himself. The person who is getting the job has ten coins in their pocket. But now suppose the boss was just kidding, and in fact, Smith was going to be offered the job instead. And suppose, unbeknownst to Smith, he himself has ten coins in his pocket. While it's clear that Smith's statement that the person who is getting the job has ten coins in their pocket is in fact true, it's equally clear that Smith does not know that it is true. He had a justified true belief, but he didn't have knowledge. The unavoidable conclusion, said Gettier, was that knowledge must be something more than justified true belief. After Gettier, philosophers struggle to find a new condition of knowledge. Traditionally, epistemology had taken the internalist view that everything necessary to provide justification is available to consciousness. Descartes and Locke, though worlds apart in many ways, were both internalists in that for them, justification had to do with internal states of conscious awareness. Externalism, by contrast, involves factors external to the person. One of the externalist theories that arose after Gettier was the causal theory of knowledge. I propose the rather radical uh, way to solve the problem, but not to solve the Gettier problem, but it was radical because of other differences in the approach that I put forward and, and what was popular at the time. So I propose the causal theory of knowing. The idea, the rough idea being that if you, if your belief in your, in your mind is causally connected up in the in appropriate way with the fact that makes what you believe true, then you know it. But if it's not connected up in the right way, then you don't know it. 